Um, I spent this past week on Facebook. My high school had our 50th reunion last weekend. Obviously, I wasn't there. I was here. <laughs> and everybody there was posting pictures, so I was stalking them to see how old they looked. <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> I think I'm glad I wasn't there. Somebody's probably saying that about me. <laughs> but one thing had not changed. Um, the high school still has the same mascot. He's a tomcat, and he showed up in almost every picture. When we were <laughs> in high school, that tomcat was pretty much how we saw ourselves, too. Brash, strong competitors, no matter where we were or what we were involved in, we were going to come out on top. But that persona was most evident in sports. Now, I was obviously not involved in sports. But <laughs> I was part of the pet band. Do you know what that is? Most places don't even have it anymore. Um, but then it was a small group that was formed from a larger band, and they traveled with the sports teams to encourage them. Um, so whenever we traveled together, anything derogatory that was hurled at the basketball team or the football team, it was also aimed at us. Imagine that. So we'd get off the school bus clearly marked from Ashland, Kentucky, home of the Tomcats, population 32,000, salute. Some of you will remember that. You watched it too. <laughs> um, and often we would be met by a group of supporters from the other team. And since we were the Tomcats, one of their very favorite insults was, hey, kitty, 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 kitty. I oh, know. To which we would respond, we are the Tomcats, the mighty, mighty Tomcats. Everywhere we go, people ought to know who we are. So we tell them. And we would tell them proudly. <laughs> ah, our plan was by the end of the game, they would know that we were not kitty cats, but Tomcats who could whip their tails. Just saying. Isn't it funny what you remember? <laughs> Some of that stuff's probably better not remembered. <laughs> but all of that came roaring back to mind when I was researching St. Mark and found out his symbol is a winged lion. Look at that. Look at that. Not a kitty cat, but a pretty big cat. You can see it in that graphic. Um, but when we meet Mark, we don't necessarily meet him in that way, do we? No. Um, the first time we encounter Mark is probably as Jesus is arrested and he runs away naked. Second time we see him, he, he um, comes back home from a missionary journey, kind of with his tail between his legs, much more kitty cat-like than lion. Well, what is it or was it that made the early church choose a lion as Mark's symbol? Some say that it came from Mark's description at the beginning of the gospel um, as, uh, of John the Baptist as the voice of one crying out in the desert, which artists somehow compare to a roaring lion. And that its wings came from the prophet Ezekiel's vision, and those four-winged characters were evangelists. And later in life, Mark was an evangelist. It fits. Um, others say it was because Mark's gospel tells us about Jesus' royalty as God's son, a kingship that we share through our baptism. As we sang a moment ago, you know, sometimes we don't see ourselves that way, but that's not how God sees us. He sees us as his children and rulers in a kingdom with him. Is it being bad? Yes. Okay. Can you fix me? <laughs> All right, we'll see. Others from the Coptic church say it stems from a story related by Severus Eben I. Makafa. I had to practice to say that. Who says that once a lion and a lioness appeared to John Mark and his father, whose name was Aristobulus, while they were traveling in the Jordan. And Mark's father was very frightened and begged his son to escape while he drew the lion's attention and awaited his fate. But supposedly, John Mark assured his father that Jesus Christ would save him, and so he bowed down and began to pray, at which point the two lions fell down dead. And as a result of this miracle, the father came to believe in Jesus and then died shortly thereafter. And that, my friends, like the Tomcat's reputation, is the stuff of legends. <laughs> That's what that is. Um, you know, in our scriptures, there's no, actually no mention of what happened later in Mark's life, with the exception of Paul's request that Mark be with him as he faces death. 
What we know, and I'll put that in quotes, comes from extra-biblical resources, mostly written by early church fathers whose other writings were generally accepted as true, but not necessarily worthy of being in the biblical canon. Now, canon is a word that describes how things included in the scripture were measured, and there were two ways of measuring it. One, the writings had to be traceable all the way back to the apostles, and second, it had to be in line with the teaching of the scripture. So those are the criterion for inclusion in the canon of what we now call the Bible. So when we read some of the early church fathers, like Clement and Oregon and Arrhenius, you take them as possible, and you look for the lessons that they might teach, but don't hang your salvation on them, okay? Yeah. For example, because of their writings, most believe that Mark was born in Cyrene, which is a city in the Pentopolis of North Africa, which bordered on Egypt. Now think about that. If that's true, then Mark, like Barnabas, went home to tell his own people about Jesus. And that would make sense, wouldn't it? Um, because that was certainly Barnabas' example to him. Um, from there, he supposedly traveled to Alexandria in Egypt, entering into its eastern gate, according to some very specific legends, around 61 AD. And on his arrival, the strap of his sandal was loose, so he went to a cobbler to mend it. Like I said, take the lessons and you know, don't hang your head on it. When the cobbler, whose name was Anionis, took an awl to work on it, he accidentally pierced his hand and was heard to cry out, Oh, one God! And upon hearing this, Mark recognized that a door had been opened for him there to preach the gospel. And after healing the man's hand, and I'll spare you how that happened, um, he began to preach to Anionis, and, and who took Mark home with him then, and later... This cobbler and all of his family were baptized and many others followed. Well, that's very likely. That happens with the gospel, doesn't it? it? Happened with a jailer and his family. It happened with Cornelius and his family. So that's very likely the lesson is sound regardless, right? Um, with that auspicious beginning, Mark founded the church at Alexandria in Egypt. And to this day, he is recognized as the founder and bishop of the Egyptian Coptic Church church. That's an orthodox church. <clears throat> Excuse me. The church there supposedly grew so much to the point that the pagans in the city got mad about it. Imagine that. Well, that true happened when Paul traveled, didn't it? They got mad at him in and, and, um, all kinds of places um, and chased him out of town. And, and like that, they wanted to kill Mark. And the church, catching wind of that, sent Mark off to teach and preach in other places. Before he left, he um, appointed Anianos to be bishop, and he also brought into service three priests. Again, if Mark was indeed a Levite, which is thought because Barnabas was a Levite, then he would have known those other Levites, wouldn't he? So bringing them into service makes perfect sense. And when the gospel was preached um, in Jerusalem, remember, a number of priests became obedient to this new faith. So it makes sense. Again, it's verified by the gospel, right? Even if it might not be exactly true here. Um, he also appointed seven deacons to serve the church, like they did in Jerusalem when people were complaining about the food distribution. Maybe. Before heading out to witness to the gospel in other places. When Mark returned to Alexandria, it was a flourishing church, and the pagans who worshipped Serapis um, who was supposedly the god of the afterlife and fertility and healing and a number of other things, became angry when their feast day coincided with Easter in 68 AD. And the number of people attending their festival dwindled because of the Christian holidays, so they determined at that point to kill Mark. And they went and found him, and he was indeed martyred there the day after Easter, and his bones were buried there in the church. Well, there is at least some historical accuracy to that. Um, his bones were supposedly stolen from Alexandria in 828 AD by two Venetian sailors and taken to Venice, where Mark was proclaimed to be the patron saint. And to this day, if you go to Venice, there are lions all over the city in St. Mark's honor. Um, and in 1968, the Vatican returned 
Mark's bones to the church in Alexandria, marking 1900 years since his martyrdom. So the Catholic Church evidently believes in those things that happen. I don't know if they did or not, but there are wonderful traditions that say that some of these things did, and they're verified by things that we can see in the scripture. Um, I do want to encourage you to look at a little bit more of Mark's story, and especially take a look at the church that he founded there in Alexandria. We don't have time to go into it today, but Alexandria, as most of you students of history will remember, was a very, very academic city. It had one of the largest libraries in the world. And Mark is often credited with establishing the school there which defended Christianity against the philosophies that were being taught in that place. Now that's huge. It might be like going to Harvard or to Yale and, and challenging the scientific assumptions with the knowledge of Jesus Christ. And here's the thing, the Coptic church, the church that he founded, um, was characterized by their early use of apologetics, a means of defending the gospel using reason and logic. They did it by looking at science and philosophy not as enemies, but rather as a jumping off point from which to prove the truth of the scriptures. It's a fascinating thing to read, and it's well worthy of your study, because he's our namesake. He's our namesake. Um, so what happened in Mark's life that changed him so radically, literally from a kitty cat to a lion? Well, I believe the answer can be seen in the way Mark writes this part of the gospel um, that we heard read just a few minutes ago. The parable of the sower speaks of the word that's constantly being sown. Now that's available to all. It falls in all these different places, doesn't it? Um, you can't go anywhere in the United States without it being available to you and most of the world um, through radio, through TV, and through YouTube. Growing up in the church, Mark heard it from the time he was a youth. But the ability of someone to receive the word, and that word can mean the good news of the gospel or Jesus who is the word made flesh, that's dependent on the state of the human heart. And how it's received, well, that's exposed in how it impacts our lives. I'll say that again. How the gospel is received is proven in how that impact is seen in our lives. Just a question for a moment. If someone was watching your life, would they see a kitty cat or would they see a lion? And how has the gospel impacted your life? Do you know who you are? Fodder. As the parable says, some will hear and ignore, some will hear and respond, but if they don't, do anything else to deepen their understanding. When trouble comes, they have no root, and their faith disappears. Some will hear, but other things are more important to them. And then there are those who will hear, and it changes everything. And it sets their life on an entirely different trajectory. Now, I believe that Mark was like many of us, because we've heard the word most of our lives, haven't we? And it's only when something happens that exposes questions and doubts about what we really believe, whether it's a crisis in our lives or a public failure like Marx or um, the contention of a disaffiliation that we have to stop and really consider, wait, what do I really believe? And who am I as a result? That we would even question is a little disconcerting, isn't it? But if Mark questioned, do you think we might? Ow! Ow! But by the way, Mark puts these parables together. He lets us know that that exposure, those questions, those doubts, may well be Jesus exposing the state of our heart. Because when those things are hidden, they can sideline us. Exposed, we have to make a decision as to what we're going to do with them. And when Mark came back to Jerusalem and then to Antioch, he had to decide what he was going to do with those things. And I think that's what changed Mark's life. 
If you notice, it changed him from one who was fearful to one who was fearless, one who would go out and proclaim the gospel, and if they came to try and kill him, well, so be it, he would be in the hands of his maker. That's, that's a fearless life. Do you have that same fearlessness in you? Amen or ouch. <laughs> so then, what do we do when those things arise? Mark tells us there in Jesus' words there that, that Thelma read there at the last, consider carefully what you hear. If you give this word, this gospel, the hearing it deserves, if you truly stop and contemplate what Jesus Christ has done for you, you will be given the ability to understand even more. And it will be life-changing. It will make you fearless. It will make you not care what happens, but rather look around to see what God's doing because that's what really matters. It's that kingdom that's coming that will really matter. And this stuff around here, yes, we've got to deal with it, and we better deal with it rightly, but what matters is what's to come, and that's where our focus will be. Amen. Amen. So who are we? For the last four weeks, we've looked at the life of St. Mark. We're named after him. We've looked to remind us who we are as a church. So what have we learned from St. Mark? Well, we're a home. That's a good thing. That's a good thing. I look around and I see the love of home in your faces and in the way you respond to one another. Thank you, Lord. We're a place where we're taught the good news. And I see many of you being raised up to teach that good news in surprising places. There's more that needs to be done. And some of you sitting there are going to need to be raised up to the place where you can teach it. That means you've got to pay attention to it because when you pay attention to it, the Lord will stir up even more in you to the point you've got to speak it. Let it be Lord. We're a place where we're forgiven when we've failed. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. We're a place of restoration and a place of healing. We're a people who mentor and strengthen and encourage others. But if we don't get that last part right, we'll fail at everything that we have been set in place at 99 East Mercury Boulevard to do. Kitty cats rest in place. They're skittish, and they run at the first sign of trouble. But lions... Lions are different. Lions take the ground wherever they go. They make sure they own it. And this particular lion, St. Mark, everywhere he went, he found a way to make believers, to make disciples of Jesus Christ. Nothing stopped him, not even death in the story of his life, is still making disciples. And so which will we be? Yeah. Will we be kitty cats? Because you can sit right here smile at each other and be nice or we can be lions and we can take this word which is a gospel filled with power to everyone who will hear it so who will we be who will we be amen